Thank you very much indeed. Um, I am a storyteller, and I'm going to tell you a story today. I want us to think during this story about what we know, therefore what we believe is reality, and what becomes a myth, what becomes part of our story, part of our legend, our history, and whether the two are the same or different. When I was coming to, um, to Manchester, I was debating which aspect of a talk I might give, and I suddenly remembered that today, 70 years ago, this man, uh, a merchant banker from Liverpool, Phil Toosey, my grandfather, arrived in Singapore. Now, this was in 1942, right at the height of the Second World War. And just to put this into perspective, for those of you who are used to mobile phones as means of communication, this was an era when telephone numbers had just two digits where everybody communicated by letter, and when um, it was almost impossible to make journeys across the world except by boat. He arrived in Singapore, therefore, not as a banker, but as a member of the British Territorial Army. He was, in fact, with his regiment on their way to Basra to fight in the Middle East when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and invaded Malaya. And his convoy was immediately turned towards Singapore, and he and 40,000 Allied troops were sent to defend Churchill's island fortress. It wasn't a great success, as I'm sure many of you know. In fact, the battle for Singapore turned out to be the greatest defeat in British military history. Toosey arrived on Singapore Island on the 20, uh, 29th of February. In fact, he disembarked. He, he landed the night before on the 28th, today's date, but he disembarked on the 29th. He had three weeks fighting, and he basically retreated from the mainland of Malaya down to Singapore Island, where he and his men waited uh, to see what would happen next. They were severely bombarded by the Japanese. And what happened next was that on the 13th of February, Toosey was sent for by General Key, who was in charge of the, Gen the, Germ the Indian troops at the top of the island, and he was told that he was to be evacuated to India in order to train another regiment. They didn't want to throw away good men because they knew that a surrender was coming. Toosey turned around to General Key and said, I will not go, sir. And the general said, but Toosey, that's an order. And he said, but sir, in the territorial army, um, an order is a matter of discussion. I will not leave my men. And with that decision, he changed the course of his life forever because he was one of the leading lights in the British Territorial Army. But he made his decision that it was more important for the commanding officer to stay with his men than to leave. And so, two days later, he and 40,000 other Allied were taken prisoner by the Japanese. And he was put to work in the middle of Singapore Island, just up here at a place called Bukit Payang. And there, he and his men were ordered to build uh, a temple and a shrine to the 4,500 Japanese who had died in the battle for Singapore. And then they were asked to build a shrine for the British, for the Australian, and for the Indians who had died. Six months later, the Japanese decided what they were going to do with their enormous bulk of prisoners of war, because in the Japanese army, it was considered a disgrace to surrender. They were basically a disgraced army. There were 40,000 of them on Singapore. There were, throughout the Japanese co-prosperity sphere sur surrounding Southeast Asia, there were 130,000 prisoners in total. So a massive, massive number of men. The Japanese had just 1,000 guards to look after these men, so insufficient, of course, but the Japanese saw it as a great potential labor force. The decision to separate the uh, staff officers from the general army was made in August, and later that month, rumours began to fly around about what the Japanese were going to do with the men. Tuzi, as I say, was in a prison camp in the middle of the island. He said that in that camp, they were relatively well treated. The men were very ill-fed, but on balance, the Japanese guards who looked after them were fairly reasonable. They allowed them access onto the golf course and they didn't treat them too harshly. But rumours were flying. There was a rumour that they were all going to be sent home with the rising sun stamped on their heads uh, and the other half of the men who weren't sent home would be killed by the Japanese. There was a rumour that Hitler was already dead, three and a half years premature. There was a rumour that they would be sent to Thailand to build a railway through the jungle. That turned out to be true. 
The Japanese had been suffering terrible losses in their shipping in the Gulf of Siam, and for several months they had been planning to build what the British had already planned in 1895, but had given up because there was lack of labour, which was a railway that would run from Banpong to Thambusiat, linking Bangkok in Thailand to Mulmain in Burma. And the purpose of the railway was to stock the Japanese Western Front for their invasion of India. They needed to get trains and supplies and men up to their Western Front. And what better use of British prisoners of war and Australians and New Zealanders than to put them to work on this railway. So Tuzi was ordered down to Singapore station and there he was put on a train with 650 men. They were herded into rice trucks. This is a drawing by the legendary artist Ronald Searle, who was also a prisoner on this railway. And it's his drawing of the men crunched into these tiny trucks that just gives some impression of the incredibly uncomfortable journey that they had going up to Thailand. Now, Tuzi, from the moment that he had taken charge of his own destiny by deciding to remain with his men and not to be separated from them, decided that he had to keep them together and to keep their morale and dignity as high as possible. And to a great extent on Singapore, he succeeded in doing this by maintaining army discipline and by maintaining a framework that the men were familiar with. Once, of course, they were subjected to such uh, inhumane conditions as these rice trucks, where they travelled for four days and three nights with only a very few stops for uh, relief and also for food, he found himself struggling to keep the men um, keep their morale high and to keep them from becoming a bit desperate. They arrived in Thailand at Ban Pong and they were then bussed up to a place called Kanchanaburi, which is a small provincial town. It was a town of about 1,500 people. There was a, a paper mill there, so there was industry in the town. And there they were to be housed in a prison camp, looked after by just five guards, 2,500 men. And the reason that they were there was because the railway could, was about to cross a huge river called the River Mae Klong, which swelled to 300 metres wide during the monsoon season. And the Japanese realised that they couldn't merely have wooden bridges, which they had uh, used for cov cov covering small rivers and culverts. They needed a really substantial bridge. But the key thing was that there were insufficient guards to manage the camp so that the British officers were put in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the camp and the guards simply shot anybody who tried to escape. Now, this is a drawing made by one of Tusi subalterns uh, after the war, showing the site of the camp, which is right down in the bottom right-hand corner. It wasn't barbed wire, as you would see in films about uh, German prisoner of war camps. It was simply a wattle fence, because, as the prisoners quite rightly pointed out, if they did try to escape, where would they go to? With their white skins, they were immediately recognisable in Thailand, and the only way of escape was through the jungle. And the jungle was, as we've heard today, one of the most inhospitable places, especially to men who were undernourished, uh, many of whom were eventually starving and ill. But the location of the camp is interesting because you see the great river Mae Klong and the two bridges, a little wooden service bridge at the bottom, which they built within eight weeks, and then the great steel and concrete bridge at Kanchanaburi, or Tamakan, as the camp was called, and that took a bit longer to build. It was started in October 42 and finished in March 1943. So there they were uh, in this camp. The jungle is just to the left. It was about 300 yards from the camp. And this was um, a farm in the centre where they could go and bit, do a bit of dealing and haggling with the ties. Now, as I said, the camp was basically run on British army lines. And when Tuzi arrived as the senior British officer, he was put in charge of the camp. He asked permission from the Japanese, as he always made sure he did whenever he addressed the prisoners. He asked permission to address the prisoners and to give them some rules that he was going to institute in running the camp of 2,500 men. The first thing the men had to do was to build their own huts. And it was very important, he felt, that the men should all be involved in doing this because they would then take pride in looking after the huts. These were huts built out of bamboo and palm atap. Not a single nail was used during the construction. And these huts were 100 metres long, and each man had a bed space on a split bamboo platform of 18 inches, or just under uh, a metre and a half, by two metres or six foot long. Not a very great space. Every time they turned over, they knocked into somebody else. The most important factor of prisoner of war life was food. 
And when Tuesday stood up in front of the men, he turned around to them and he said, I intend to keep the discipline in this camp much as I have done in Singapore, but we will abolish the officers' mess and the officers' sleeping headquarters. Now, it's probably incomprehensible to us today what a desperately shocking thing that was for him to do. But he knew that each of the men, regardless of whether they were working, which the men were, or were not working, which the officers were not forced to do, they were all going to receive 650 calories a day, which comprised rice, a few vegetables, a little bit of meat occasionally. And he was insistent that his officers should not be seen to be favoured over and above the men. And this was something that very much endeared the men to him because he real they realised that he was on their side. So this is a photograph of one of the um, kitchen scenes. He supervised the kitchens every night to make sure that fair dues as far as possible were being had. The second thing he insisted on was hygiene. No beards, they harboured lice and they caused low morale. Every man, after working, however exhausted he was, after doing labour work on the railway, had to go down to the river to swim, to wash his clothes. And then he began on the Japanese and he said to the men, if you will be loyal to me, if you will trust me, I will make sure that I intervene on your behalf every time there is an unnecessary beating, every time there is violence towards you. And in return, I will also try and get extra food for you. And he lobbied the Japanese hard. He said to them that if they gave the men slightly better rations, their health would improve, morale would improve, there would be more men to go to work. Now that has been construed as some as collaborating with the Japanese. But Tuzi's aim was never to collaborate. It was simply to make sure that his single duty, which he felt he had to the men, was to get as many of them back home as possible, as safely as he possibly could. So the wooden bridge was finished within um, six or eight weeks. As I said, this is a photograph um, of the bridge under construction. And as you can see, it's the Japanese engineers who are overseeing the construction of the bridge as they did on the metal bridge. Uh, as you can see, there's an Aussie here in a slouch hat. And it's the Japanese engineers who are overseeing the lowering of the comb trusses onto the bridge. And it's very important this because in um, other stories, one's heard that the Japanese were considered inferior engineers and the British had advised on how the British should be built. Absolutely not the case. The British and Australian prisoners of war and the Dutch were simply used as slaves by the Japanese in order to get their railway built as soon as possible. Now, Tuzi's methods were very simple. He had, as I said, just the one aim. He wanted to get as many of his men home safely as possible after the war. He had already estimated in February 1942 it would take roughly three and a half years for the Allies to defeat the Japanese. He was absolutely accurate. And so his methods of incrementally taking responsibility away from the Japanese, ensuring that his men believed in his vision, which was to get them home safely, helped him to get the trust of the men in the prisoner of war camps. And his methods were so successful that they were copied up right up the railway, right into the jungle. And in fact, um, after the war, this cartoon was sent to him by one of the Dutch prisoners who was in his camp. And he wrote to Tuzi and he said, what you really did, sir, was to understand the men. And I think that was the key message he wanted to get over, was that he knew their plight, he understood the position that they were in. Now, 20, nearly 20 years later, in fact, not even 20, 14 years later, this film came out, Bridge on the River Kwai, probably one of the most famous war films of all time. It told the story of the construction of a bridge over uh, a river. And very quickly, the prisoners of war who went to watch this film decided that the film was probably based on the story of Tuzi and the construction of the bridge over the River Meiklong, or the River Kwai, which it, of course, has now been renamed. The crux of the story is the confrontational relationship between Alec Guinness, playing as the British officer Colonel Nicholson, and Sesui Hakayawa, who plays Colonel Saito in the film. It's a deeply frustrating relationship to watch, I have to tell you, knowing the other side of the story. But Nicholson insists the Japanese are incapable of building the bridge, and he suggests to, to Saito that if, he, if Saito allows the British engineers and the British officers to take command, they will build a Bretter Bridge and to Tokyo time. The historical reality understood and known by the prisoners of war of the Japanese was completely subsumed by the rollicking, fantastic Hollywoodization of their story. 
And it was something that the prisoners of war felt very bitterly about because they knew what Tuzi had done. They knew that many of them owed their life to him. And they knew, above all, that confrontation, as you can see from this photograph, he was a very genial, very uh, gentle character. Confrontation was the furthest thing from his mind. He knew that culturally the Japanese could never be seen to lose face. And so confrontation was something that was absolutely impossible in the prison camps. It was his imagination to make tiny changes, to institute little tweaks to the way the camps were run that helped to save lives. One statistic, just one statistic only. 60,000 prisons of war were used to build the Thailand-Burma Railway. 12,000 died, a life for every sleeper. 700,000 Ramusha, or um, Thai-Burmese labourers, were used to build the railway. 83,000 of them died. The rate of death on the railway was absolutely horrific. In Tuzi's prison camp, out of the 2,500 men who helped to build the bridge, just nine men died. Now, he would always have argued that he was more fortunate. His camp was not in the jungle. It was below the jungle. He had clean water. He had access to more food than the men up in the jungle. But the fact of the matter is that his gentle, sensible, and thorough determination to to have this one task in his mind, which was to bring his men home, was really what paid off. And I want to finish with a quote, not from an Englishman, but from a Japanese man, who ironically also was called Saito. He was Regimental Sergeant Major Saito, who was second in command of the camp at Tamakan. At the very end of the war, he and Tuzi met. For a long period, Saito wrote in 1974, I have been harbouring the wish to meet you and to express my thanks to you. I especially remember in 1945 when the war ended and when our situations were completely reversed. I was gravely shocked and delighted when you came to shake me by the hand as only the day before you were a prisoner. You exchanged friendly words with me and I discovered what a great man you are. Even after winning, you were not arrogant or proud. You are the type of man who is a real bridge over the battlefield. Later, he wrote to Patrick, Tuzi's son, after Tuzi had died. He came to visit Tuzi's grave in 1984, a year before his own death. And he wrote, I feel very fine because I finished my own duty. One thing I regret, I could not meet Mr. Philip Tuzi when he was alive. He showed me what a human being should be. He changed the philosophy of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, 70 years ago today, he landed in Singapore. Thank you for having me.